All right then, uh, moving along here into uh, our next uh, discussion um, in John David Ebert uh, 101. Um, so now sliding down the shaman's world axis, let's say, or, or rather um, ascending up it, uh, we will now journey into the other world. Um, we'll undertake in this video kind of a shamanic journey of our own. Uh, I will share what I've figured out about the afterlife and the cosmology of the afterlife based on my studies and researches on Rudolf Steiner, um, and then also uh, various researches first into near-death experiences, which I researched heavily, uh, and then eventually to uh, using mediums to talk to the dead. Uh, starting with my mother's death a few years ago, uh, for the first time I actually found a good medium to channel her for me um, on the other side, spoke to her, and then uh, basically ran with it. After that, I started using mediums to talk to dead philosophers and and I had a girlfriend who committed suicide, so I used the medium to talk with her for a couple of years um, and so forth. So I will share what I have learned. Um, the first point to note is that the soul does indeed survive the death of the body. As it turns out, that tradition is correct. That is the correct idea. The soul is a, 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 a sort of ball of energy. It's an energy vehicle, uh, but it does contain your same consciousness within it. You, you have access to, uh, oh, on the other side, I mean, access to your memories, but also to all your past life memories. So your memory database is much larger. Imagine being a person who could remember all your past lives and you had all that knowledge, wisdom, and experience to draw from, which is one of the reasons why when people contact their dead friends and relatives, they're a little different. Um, they're not quite the same. They are the same, but not the same. Um, part of that too is the fact that mental illnesses are not there. Mental illnesses are a function of brain chemistry once you're out of your body, the brain is not there to distort and warp the personality, which is basically what it does. The brain is a kind of magnifying glass that is used down here to focus consciousness on the low vibrational frequency realm of dense matter. And that's another difference here, uh, is to understand this concept between uh, the concept of uh, vibrational frequency. The difference between this world, the physical plane, and that world has to do with the fact that the other world vibrates at a much higher frequency than this world. So the wave frequency is very rapid, very high vibrational frequency down here. Everything is very low, slow, dense, long wave vibrational frequency. The material world is dense and it comes along with very dense emotions that have to do with being incarnate in an animal body that has evolved through the animal world. So in a, in a certain sense, we have uh, we have a twofold origin. We have an evolutionary origin that comes from being in an animal body, and that brings along with it certain low vibrational frequency drives and emotions, such as territoriality, aggression, selfishness, uh, competing with others. All that has to do with being biologically incarnate. They don't have that stuff on the other side. On the other side, as I've learned from talking with these beings, they do have basically the same range of thoughts and feelings they use swear words. Uh, they talk the same way, pretty much. Um, they're, they're not like zombies or some bizarre entity. Um, I am Ray Elian here to channel you information. That's a cliche. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. They're pretty much the same. They experience pretty much the same gamut of emotions, such as uh, embarrassment, um, sadness, um, mostly joy and happiness because they're tuned to a higher frequency, but they can't experience some of the low vibrational stuff. The thing is they don't get stuck in it though. We, we get stuck in things like anger, jealousy, greed, envy, depression. We get stuck, they don't. They're able to cycle through that much more quickly and they don't experience those low vibrational frequency emotions to, to the same extent we do down here uh, because they don't have biology over there. So they don't have uh, the inheritance of physical animal bodies that bring them down to that level. Um, so that's point number one, or cluster of points number one, or something like that. Um, so then, uh, so the soul survives the death of the body. The first thing that happens to it when you get over there, uh, you may or may not go through the famous tunnel. Uh, some near-death experiences recount that, some don't. But the first thing that, that pretty much happens for everyone is a past life, is a life review. Um, so they go over your life. Uh, they being the spiritual beings that are called spirit guides um, who have been assigned to you throughout your life 
um, spirit guides are beings who were human and went through the whole reincarnational cycle uh, and got out of it. And so now, kind of like bodhisattvas, they sort of hover around uh, to help us poor unfortunates with our lives. And so those are spirit guides, whereas angels, which as it turns out, actually do exist on the other side, uh, have never been human. Um, they're not human in any way, shape, or form, and they have never been human. And they are higher dimensional beings, uh, which are associated with the big macro aspects of creation. Zeitgeists, uh, huge cultural evolutionary epochs. That's sort of their game, their department. Uh, and I'm sure there's a, there's a whole uh, zoology of beings over there. Um, so they help you with your life review. Now, correspondingly, um, you also have a life preview before you incarnate. Uh, so what happens now, we have to get into the issue of free will, uh, karma, and um, fate. And as it turns out, a lot of what a lot of what do the things that do happen to us have been chosen by us. The primary significant things. There's a lot of stuff that isn't, but the primary significant things, the big things, a car accident that nearly kills you or does kill you. Uh, you murder someone. Uh, sometimes suicide is contracted. Sometimes it isn't. So let's get into this idea of contracts now, which is to say that uh, when you decide you're ready to incarnate again. Um, and it's a free will choice. It's not something you have to do. Uh, it's a free will choice based on your karma, which has to do with where you've been in previous lives, where you're at now, let's say on the other side, and where you want to go to. Certain karmic potentialities are available to you. Not everything is. Um, if you're a bug, let's say, and everything that's alive has a soul. Every tree, every everything that's living has a soul. Um, and so when it dies, you squash a bug, let's say, it pops over onto the other side, this little bug soul, and it is a bug soul, and then it can decide uh, how it wants to reincarnate, what based on what options are available to it. Can't jump from a bug soul to a human soul. There's an evolutionary progression that has to be worked through. Certain things are available. Maybe it can be, I don't know, uh, a, a more noble bug, like a butterfly, let's say, or maybe then next time it can move up uh, to a frog, let's say. It moves like that. So in a certain sense, the evolution of the soul recapitulates the evolution on the planet, but in a larger macro scale. Um, so certain karmic potentialities are available to you for each incarnation, and you're able to choose which difficulties you want, which ones you don't, which ones you think are necessary for your soul's progress. Because all of this, and this is what Rudolf Steiner got right, all of this is about evolution. The soul is undergoing an evolution. It isn't just a fixed point of light that sits there, uh, like in some Indian systems, although I think the Indians came the closest. Hindu came, Hinduism is the closest to getting it, the, the actual ontology of the world correct. It is based on reincarnation and the survival of the soul. The, the soul has been created from God, sort of I imagine it, um, I'm not sure how they're created, but I imagine them as like, a, like God is a fire and then sparks of light that are emitted from that fire. Uh, so souls come into being and they're constantly coming into being uh, and going through these processes. We can also incarnate on other planets, as it turns out. Um, I have heard from the dead that uh, aliens are real, actually. Uh, they are actually beings from other planets using technologies to intersect with this world. Um, that apparently is correct. So there's life on other worlds, but as it turns out, uh, from what I've heard, Earth is the toughest of all the places and therefore, the most popular. You would think it would be, from our point of view, it would be the least popular place. I don't want to drive into some ghetto in LA where there's gangs and guns everywhere. The dead have the opposite attitude. They think, oh, well, that's where all the learning is going to take place. That's where I'm going to learn the most lessons. So Earth is a very popular place for incarnation and has gotten more and more popular over time. Uh, as we have more biological vessels available to receive more souls, there's lots of them eager to get down here. I don't know why, personally, <laughs> I'm not that fond of this place, but uh, apparently they see things a little differently over there. Schopenhauerian pessimism need not apply on the other side. Uh, and I've interviewed Schopenhauer on the other side. And he said, uh, I remember him saying, you know, I I don't take back my pessimism. I, I, I think life is based on suffering. So he's a little different than some of these souls. Um, anyhow, so you have contracts and you, you agree to certain things. Uh, oh, I've never murdered someone. Um, I want to try that. I want to see what that experience is like. 
Uh, so you go through that experience and you find out what it's like. Um, oh, I've never had a wife who uh, betrayed me and s slept with a bunch of guys. Um, my, my soul needs that experience to grow. That's how it works. Um, the soul is attracted to these kinds of difficulties because they don't have suffering over there. That, so you have to understand this, that um, there's a lot going on over there. It is a world just like ours where shit happens. All kinds of stuff is going on. Uh, souls are meeting each other, having conversations. They also have sex over there, by the way, as I've learned. Um, it's a little different. It's lower priority, they say, whereas down here it's like priority number two, let's say after eating, uh, survival of preservation of the self and then preservation of the species are the two primary drives. Over there, it's, it's like priority number 12. It's, it's, it's quite a bit further down, but they do have it, even though they don't have genitals and they don't have biological bodies. Uh, what they can do, though, is their energy bodies rub up against each other, and it creates a very pleasurable friction, just like sex, except that unlike our sex, it's not localized to one spot on the body. The whole body becomes like a genital organ, uh, and I've heard that it's very pleasurable, <laughs> but it has nothing to do with reproduction. So... Uh, whereas down here, it has everything to do with reproduction, which is why it's such a primary drive. The species has to survive because we've got a lot, of, a lot of souls to bring down here. They're, they're waiting in line <laughs> to, get, to get down here. Um, so there's that. So you have these karmic contracts, their agreements, and those are the big things that will happen to you. I have learned that my divorce, uh, for example, was contracted. Um, I had done this woman an in, in injustice in a previous life. And so the divorce was contracted, which means there wasn't a single thing I could have done to, to have changed that. Uh, I didn't know that till because I didn't get into this stuff until well into my 40s. I was 45-ish before I started figuring all this stuff out. Um, so, um, so a lot of these things are, that happen to you are contracted, um, but you've already used your free will to agree to them in the first place. So free will is fundamental and essential. The German uh, idealist philosophers had this correct. Free will is fundamental. Um, even on the other side, uh, you can choose to agree to these contracts or not. You can also, so they give you a, a, a preview, a life preview, and they say, that here's the, the sketchy outlines of what's going to happen to you. Uh, do you want it this way? you want to modify it? They'll let you modify it. Um, they try to encourage you, I've heard, not to make it too rough, but some people like it rough. <laughs> uh, not just in the bedroom. Some people like it rough, period. Um, so... Um, so then you, so now the free will down here then consists in the fact of how you respond to these things that uh, have happened to you. Let's say I agreed to my divorce before I incarnated. So I go through the marriage, have the divorce. Now, how do I deal with it? That's the test. That's where the free will comes in. Uh, that based on how you respond to it, then it's going to generate new karma that will have karmic effects on your next lifetime. Um, and there is something called the law of karmic balancing then, which is another fundamental thing, uh, which is if you've had an easy life before, chances are you're going to want a rough life uh, in the next one. Uh, and it has nothing to do with punishment. Uh, the Christians got this all wrong. Uh, Christianity got a pretty confused idea of how all this works. Uh, it's just not authentic. About the only thing Christianity got right, as far as I can tell, is the survival of the soul after death. That's it. As far as I can tell, everything else in Christianity is wrong. Um, so the idea is then that you go through these things and you experience, uh, how, how you respond to them based on your free will, uh, which is going to determine, uh, how things are going to be next time. Uh, let's say you murder someone. Chances are, uh, in a subsequent life, that person will kill you. Uh, again, based on karmic balancing, not morality. Um, there's a certain amorality about the dead, not, not an actual total amorality, but they don't, they just don't look at things in the same morally judgmental way that we do. It's not quite that simple. They do have morality in a certain sense that another one of the things that we incarnate for is to master certain cardinal or, or certain uh, primary virtues. Uh, and there are usually each incarnation has a running theme of, let's say, two or three of these virtues. One might be compassion. Maybe you were a cold bastard last time. So now you need to learn the virtue of compassion or the virtue of forgiveness or the virtue of patience. There's like two or three of them which become a leading theme through a person's life. And as you look back over your life, you'll, you'll see what one of your leading themes has been. Your birth chart in astrology will also reflect this. Astrology is eminently compatible with uh, karma and reincarnation. In fact, 
your birth chart is a snapshot of your karma uh, for this lifetime. It's the seed, the entelechy, from out of which the events of your life will unfold. Uh, and I've checked this. Uh, I got into astrology way before I got into afterlife stuff, back when I was uh, 30, I believe. Uh, so it's been with me for a long time. I've studied it forever. It works. It is 100% uh, correct. And also, you can also, uh, with composite charts, such as synastry charts, which has to do with couple compatibility, uh, but not just that. Now, you can take a chart from anyone else and look at it and composite with your own, and you can see if there are karmic connections uh, from a past life on that chart. It has to do with the moon's nodes, the north node and the south node. Uh, the south node has to do with past life karma, and the north node on that chart will tell you where you're trying to get to. Um, and I've checked that, too, and it works. The nodes are correct. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so astrology works, and it's part of this whole world. Uh, astrology, karma, reincarnation, they all go together as a single package. They are correct. Uh, reincarnation fell out of the West. It was only there briefly with the Orphics on the one hand and Pythagoras on the other. There are hints of it in Plato, uh, but it dropped out after that, uh, primarily because of Christianity uh, with this idea of, uh, of a single shot life. And um, so then with respect to now the, the picture of where you are going. Um, so, uh, but before we get to that, one of the things I've learned in talking with the dead, uh, they have a sense of humor. Uh, they crack jokes, dirty jokes even. Um, so they're, they're very, very similar to the way we are here. Um, I don't know exactly what they look like. Now, there are two ways, though, of accessing your past life memories. We generally, when we're born, we, ha we have a memory wipe, like C-3PO and R2-D2 at, uh, at the end of the Star Wars prequels. Uh, they have to have a memory wipe. <laughs> so by the time we meet with them in Star Wars 4, 5, and 6, they don't remember their previous lives. It's kind of like that. Um, we have a memory wipe that I suppose just has to do with being biologically incarnate. Um, but through regressive hypnosis, which I've tried once, uh, and it does work, you, uh, you will have a, a person, the therapist, guide you backwards through time, uh, through your life, see if you can remember your birth, and go back beyond that to remembering your most recent death, which I did. Uh, and as it turns out, and I, I didn't learn this particular detail from uh, the therapist, I already knew this from talking with the dead, that my most recent past life, I was my great-grandfather who was a surgeon in uh, World War II. Um, already that karma made sense to me as soon as I heard that. And I learned this from three different mediums, none of whom knew each other, totally unaffiliated, and talking with my dead mother and my dead girlfriend who committed suicide a few years ago. Um, they all said the same thing. I was my great-grandfather, my, my mother's grandfather, um, who was a surgeon. And the karma so makes sense to me because a surgeon is one who masters the physical body. Um, this was a guy who mastered biology and the physical body, which I have a very poor relationship with, but my karma this time, I wanted to master the metaphysical realm. Uh, so that karma makes perfect sense to me, 100%. Um, and so another point to notice there too, is that um, we tend to reincarnate in groups, um, sort of tribes, as I've heard it referred to. Uh, it may be a very large group, uh, but we do shift roles around. Uh, a father and a daughter can incarnate one time and then next time be a brother and a sister or just friends. Um, but it pretty much turns out to be the case. And Rudolf Steiner says this too. He is another one of the things that uh, my studies confirmed. Uh, when I first read Rudolf Steiner, I just read him for poetry. I didn't think it was real. Uh, it turns out now, uh, I think most of what he said was correct. Not everything. Um, but um, most of the people with whom you have significant kinds of relationships with friends, lovers, and so forth, are people with whom you have had past lives with. Um, it may, they may have been brief, uh, they may have been large, um, but chances are, and you can check this with astrology, chances are you have had past life encounters with them. But not everyone, obviously. It's not everyone you sleep with or everyone you meet. Uh, it's the significant relationships, the ones that um, involve a certain degree of emotionality, a certain degree of emotional significance. Because most of what we're doing here has to do with relating to other souls. That's the whole point of all this. So what uh, apparently has happened is that these creator beings, whatever they are, 
Rudolf Steiner has a polytheism of creator beings, which he calls angels. Um, maybe they're angels, maybe not. Has, but they have created the physical world as a place, especially Earth, as a place where all the ground rules have been set up against love. Over there, they have everyone is loving and happy. Uh, no one's mean to each other. They just don't do that shit. Cruelty is unknown. Uh, meanness is unknown. Uh, they're not tuned to that frequency. But now imagine living in a world like that where suffering does not exist and they wonder about it. What does it, what is it, what's it like to suffer? What's it like to experience pain? What's it like to hurt someone else? Um, let's create earth. Let's create the physical world. So they create it as a place of learning so souls can incarnate, come down here and learn about suffering, learn about pain, learn about uh, how do you respond to this? How do you in, uh, incarnate in a world where all the ground rules are set up against love uh, because they have to do with the animal body and territoriality and so forth and all the things that go with the animal instincts and emotions which are primarily competitive and you have a world where you have to eat and in order to eat you have to kill things even trees have souls plants even the carrot has a soul so you have to kill stuff in order to keep your existence going um, so the whole world is set up based on this horrible insight that all life is sorrowful it's based on suffering. Lives are ripping each other to pieces to preserve each other. Um, but that's the, the game. That's the experiment. That's why it's interesting to these beings. Uh, that's why we want to keep doing it. And as you go through these lives, your soul, um, and you get back onto the other side, your soul isn't quite the same. It's different because it's been modified by the influences and the karma that you've experienced while being here. So now you know a little bit more about compassion this time around. Now you know a little bit more about uh, this, the effects of hating someone this time. Now you know a little bit more about uh, mistreating someone or uh, having someone mistreat you and then forgiving them and so forth. Um, so these are lessons learned uh, that when you get back onto the other side, the, the soul grows. So it's a little bit like a, a macro version of your lifetime here where your soul grows and goes through. You learn these things as you go along. Um, but there's lots of other shit you didn't learn because you didn't get to experience it. That's why we have multiple lives. So we can experience the macro version of all this until we get to the point where we're sated, we're ready to go, we can let go of incarnation and we get out of it. And then we become these spirit guides or elders or whatever they are who then help others along on this process. And then so the souls eventually... Um, probably will be reabsorbed again eventually into the macro soul that we call God, which is the ultimate prime source energy. And eventually the universe, of course, will run down and collapse. But apparently from what I've heard, uh, it keeps doing this like a heartbeat. There's a big bang, expansion, life, collapse. Uh, it's been doing this apparently forever. Uh, as impossible as that is for our, our limited monkey brains to understand, we always have to factor in that we're, we have these monkey brains uh, that are channeling a higher spiritual consciousness and which probably also helped bring it into being. The more our brains become advanced, the more neocortex we have, the more of our higher soul that we can draw down into being down here. And the more similar that we therefore become to how we really are on the other side, uh, where they have access to a lot more knowledge and facts and information than we do. All right, so that in a nutshell is pretty much what I've learned about the afterlife. So we'll stop here uh, with the cosmology of the afterlife and that, that's pretty much the upshot of it. Um, so then we'll proceed uh, next to the next topic.